Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Distance DevOps. Uh, this week, we had Chris Short talking about his Amazon billing and how things can go wrong very quickly. Fascinating topic because uh, we talked about just what can happen, how to prevent it, prevent it, and sort of the broader challenge that you have with managing your bill. And important housekeeping, uh, we are moving this uh, weekly DevOps Day scheduling link to the Cloud 2030 community. So please join us there. We're going to be talking topics, putting sessions there, recordings. There's a lot more going on on that site than uh, from the ra that Racket homepage. So Distance DevOps is growing up, becoming part of a bigger thing. Uh, and we hope you will come and join us and, and be part of making uh, the Cloud 2030 community amazing. You want to get started on uh, talking about yeah, AWS no, Horror Stories? Go, go. You're, you, you've, you've, you've got the mic anyway. So Chris, give us some background. Tell us, I, I, I do think it's worth you know, bring everybody up speed on the communities you've been building too. And so, uh, sure. So I'm Chris short. Uh, I work at red hat. I'm on the OpenShift team there. I also, uh, have a property called openshift.tv that I help manage. Um, as well as I am a CNCF ambassador, which also means since I'm a newsletter writer, I also help curate cube weekly and I write the newsletter DevOps ish on top of, all of that. I'm a disabled veteran too. I spent 11 years in the Air Force and I live outside of the Detroit metro area with my son and wife. I have a daughter also in school at the University of Cincinnati right now. So hence the Cincinnati Bearcat flag right there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I grew up in the, the bowels of Florida. So that's all the gator gear. Um, but you know, I've had websites and various things across the internet for you know, decades now, and you know, years ago, you know, long before you know, Cloudflare had restrictions on anything. Practically, I stood up what I called CDN.ChrisShort.net, and it still exists today. And you know, it's just for files that are just too big to put in Git or too, you know, too, too, you know, you don't want it to be served from just one location. Um, and I want to utilize the backbone of Cloudflare to serve out things from an S3 bucket, essentially, right? So S3 bucket is public, um, but I've never had an issue with people hitting the origin of the S3 bucket, like ever. Um, so I did not even have it locked down to the Cloudflare IP addresses when the incident we're gonna talk about today happened. Um, so this, I mean, this, this CDN, this S3 bucket had less than 300 files in it. You know, it's JPEGs, it's PDFs, some 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 larger MP4s, maybe uh, some MP3 recordings, stuff like that, right? Like, I try to build my website as like an archive for like my grandchildren, essentially, to like go back through time and see all the stuff that Granddad did, right? Like when he worked in a public, you know, facing fashion. Um, so you know, it's like a, a museum of sorts. So I, I store a lot of stuff, and it gets linked, and it rarely gets downloaded, and no big deal. So, uh, did my camera just freeze? Sorry. Yes, it did. Oh, yeah, it did. Eh, hang on, I'll fix that. Let's try that now. Oh, it is totally hosed. Sweet. Switching to guns. Um, let's see, where are you settings? It's interesting. Did you use a video paused uh, graphic or is that? Because that is actually OBS? the app that's broken. Okay. Uh, so I'll use my Oh, it's because someone was calling me. That'll do it every time. Mm. Uh, yes. So I use my phone as my camera. So that's uh. a issue I need to fix. Anyways, sorry about that. <clears throat> um, darn you, do not disturb, not activating. So one day at work, you know, we have this, I have this bucket. It's out there. It, it does what it does. It's been doing what it's done, doing for years. It's cost me pennies, you know, no big deal. Um, so one day at work, a buddy of mine's like, hey, you're handy with Windows and good with, you know, moving big files around the internet. I need a Windows SQL image, uh, at least trial licensed, but totally patched to run uh, an OpenShift virtualization. Or at the time, it was just CNV, container native virtualization, which is based on KubeVirt. Um, so I said, okay, cool, you no problem. You know, I'll throw it in this bucket. Here's a link to it. Uh, the link was through Cloudflare um, because I didn't think anything of it, right? And Cloudflare wasn't going to cache it. Even if it did, it was only 13 gigs and it was one coworker. No big deal, right? Uh, well, 
the link got shared and shared around some more and shared around some more. And then lo and behold, June 23rd and 24th, uh, an event occurred, probably some broken CI somewhere in the, the European region, maybe, or APEC, we don't know. It was definitely not US-based because of the time zone offset. It like rolled over a night, basically. Um, something went out of control and downloaded this file uh, thousands of times. Um, so a few lessons learned from that. That'll download, you download a 13 gig file 2,392 times. That equals around 31 terabytes. With 31 terabytes of egress from S3 is not cheap at all. As a matter of fact, it's just under $2,700. So on July 4th, when my bill showed up, because I did not have alerting turned on, because I've never had a problem with this bucket ever. And even if I did have alerting turned on, it would have occurred. I would have gotten an alert eight hours after the fact. It would have been in the middle of the night. It would have been another few hours before I could have gotten to it. I still would have racked up probably $1,800. You know, so not quite my mortgage, you know, <laughs> but almost my mortgage. Um, so yeah, regardless, this was just an out of control situation that I should have managed better, right? So, but there were some lessons learned, right? Like A, don't mix personal and work stuff, right? Like right off the bat, stupid idea. Should have known better, should have, should have learned that lesson long ago or should have, you know, remembered that lesson from long ago. Um, second, <clears throat> Cloudflare only caches files up to 512 megabytes for business people too. Uh, enterprise customers, I think get five gigs. Um, according to Waleed. Oh. So even if I was an enterprise Cloudflare customer, they were still going to send all the requests to origin and not cache a single thing because it was also not a supported file format. Um, now, mm -hmm. another interesting wrinkle that I learned through working with AWS the past few weeks is that uh, there was definitely, it was definitely something downloading it that was written in Go because it just had this Go user agent. Um, but it was downloading it as a multi-part download, which means it's supposed to just grab a section of the file and, you know, store that to disk and grab another section and store that to disk and then eventually get the whole file as a multi-part git. Uh, Cloudflare serves up multi-part gits from S3 as full gits. So instead of sending, you know, like 100 megs, it sent the full 13 gigs. And then the client didn't know what to do with that, so it dropped it on the floor and tried again, and tried again, and tried oh. again. Yeah, so that's how we racked up $2,600 and change in an AWS bill. So needless to say, so this July 4th was a scary so it, morning. It could have just been like one It, could, it literally two. could have been one cluster just trying to spin up a couple of VMs. And re-downloading it 100 times each. Trying to do multi-part like gets, yeah. Part. It literally could have been like one person trying to do this. That's the scary part, right? Like one person caused this bill. And, you know, to an enterprise, $2,600 probably would be, you know, a drop in the bucket, right? Like no big deal. But to a personal, you know, customer, that is something to behold. Because now there's all these sharp edges around Cloudflare that you have to worry about. Where normally in my, you know, in my admission, omission, I did not read the updated, you know, terms of service every time they came out over the years. You know, I've been using Cloudflare forever, <laughs> never realized there was a restriction that they put in place, you know, and this finally bit me because of this one-off use case that never should have happened to begin with because I should have just dropped the damn thing in Google Drive where, you know, we put our enterprise files and let Google deal with it. Right. And it also would not have been uh, directly internet accessible. That was the main reason why I didn't do it. So, yeah, the the but, the coworker needed it to be internet accessible. Did you have any idea that it was getting, mm -hmm. you know, was was linked so deeply? No, I had no idea that it was shared across so many uh, people, or that um, it was being used so frequently. Right, like I could probably if. 
in my next you know iteration of the CDN, I will be able to log exactly where these requests are coming from. And I'm hoping that at some point I will find the person that you know is looking for this you know random Q cow file. <laughs> <laughs> for, for. So so I'm assuming you immediately remove the file. Immediately remove the files was step one because I was like, there's only one thing in this bucket that has like changed significantly in the past month. Right. Like I don't put stuff in that bucket often. Right. Like it's not like every day I'm writing blog posts and uploading assets. Right. Like right. it's, it was only so wait, a few hundred assets. This is a, this was a new file. Okay. I like mm -hmm. when I read your, your stuff, I had assumed that this was like a sleeper file from a, a year ago. No, no. I mean, it had been there for uh, months, but, uh, you know, I'd forgotten about it. You know, it was long enough for me to have not realized that it was there and, you know, still, potentially explosive <laughs> you know if that makes sense it makes a lot of sense yeah the the you know you you fire and forget sometimes the yeah well he dropped it in chat the exact what, language would there. you would it have been better if you had given them a direct link to the s3 bucket instead of Pavlov? if only if and i don't know if the if the if it came from aws that would have been the only way it would have actually like been better Right, like if if a customer or person or whoever was trying to stand up a cluster inside AWS and requested it directly to S3, it would have been free, right? right? Uh, it's because it was egress out through the internet. Mm -hmm. That's why it costs money. Right, I guess, I guess I'm thinking that if you, so like we, we have a whole bunch of stuff in S3 buckets and one sure. of the things that we, um, and actually I'll, there, there's a whole little story on this, but the, you know, Cloudflare is handy if you're globally caching, but for something mm -hmm. big, I'd be like, you know, you're going to haul it across the backbone of the internet. Have a great day. I, I guess I'm curious about why, why did you, know, why give out the Cloudflare link instead of the S3 link? Okay. Didn't think otherwise, right? Like it's like the bucket cdn.chrisshort.net. That's what I've always used, right? You know, gotcha. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's literally what I've used for decades. I mean, seriously, like, oh, I've so you not think, give you the, think of that as your website, right? So your it, website, yeah. Like, I basically think of it as another part of the website, right? Like, it's just that static bucket that just sits there, you know. Because right now, my website is like a Hugo deployed static site through Netlify, so I need some places to store things that get LFS can't even you know handle very well right because get LFS is kind of flaky when it comes to you know web pages too right you know I don't necessarily want to be pushing hundreds of gigs of git around the internet either so but yeah it was a it was a shocking experience uh <laughs> AW, AWS made some mistakes too on their part right like they made a phone call that got flagged as suspicious by not not by my like flagging app, but by Verizon, right? Like it came through the Verizon network that this was a suspicious number. And uh, so I answered it anyway, knowing that it was Seattle, right? The area code. And um, it's like, okay. And I could, it was a very, very, very bad link, right? Like I think that's why Verizon maybe like it came through some cell network, but I could tell it was maybe an AWS like employee maybe but because it was so public i could not be certain and could not get like a good way to verify like cleanly because mm -hmm. of the bad connection so like but you know when i reached out to my connection on the back end they were like there's no reason for them to pick up the phone and call you and they didn't put in the ticket why they needed to call you so that's oh. weird um this was oh so yeah like, like i mean this is public so yeah, this is after it had okay. gone public so it was you know this is like july like fifth or sixth at this point right like okay. um it was during the holiday weekend i think or right after um but it had already gone public i'd already filed a ticket we'd already been working you know this is the this is what i've done to mitigate this is what i've done to you know make sure it doesn't happen again kind of thing we'd already been doing that whole deal and then this phone call out of the blue happened which made it even more suspicious and now it's like holy crap do i need to be worried about getting fished now right like oh great you know you know it's like all these things like if you reveal your back end now people know like how to get you know some extra information about you right so just right. sharing some technical details could make you a potential you know spear phishing you know 
contact victim. So, you know, that was my mode of thinking at the time. It was actually a legit employee that, you know, was calling, but they had no reason potentially to call, right? Like they didn't put anything in the ticket. So, um, whatever, it was just the, the, the nature of it all, my anxiety, you know, like dealing with the, Shit, yeah. the, the, the PTSD and everything, right? Like it triggered a whole bunch of emotions that like I hadn't felt in a long time. Um, and it was just like crisis mode for like a week. So that was like hard to deal with for a while, you know, just, but, you know, luckily Corey Quinn jumped in. He was like, you know, let me do a full analysis. Let me make sure you, you know, you use it as intended, but something went horribly wrong, right? Like um, somewhere. And that's when we started doing some digging and finding, you know, A, the 512 limit on Cloudflare. That would have just immediately threw me out. Um, but then like the multi-part get problem and the fact that, you know, we were sending full copies of the file when only parts of it were being requested. That right there is a bug that like Cloudflare and S3 need to figure out together because that's right. not good. Um, you know, I know that you're probably not going to be wanting to cache 13 gig, you know, files on a regular basis, Cloudflare, but if somebody's asking for a multi-part of it, you can't deliver the full thing. And I don't well, know where that problem lives, if it's somewhere in the S3 world or the Cloudflare world, but that needs to get worked on and looked at. I know that. that that's a serious, <laughs> I mean, that to me, when, when you look at it, yeah, when you come back and you're like, and when Corey's looking at the bill, it's like, dude, you, this, this is not me. Fix your, right. you know, yeah, right. hey, like, hey, yeah, I made a mistake, but y'all need to figure, figure that out too, because... Right. Like I did not get like yeah. some massive influx of traffic. Right. Like I, I fully, you know, I fully disclose all analytics for all of my web properties. Um, you can you can go to my projects page on chrisshort.net and you can click on every single one of them. You can look at the days. There is no spike in activity. Nothing yeah. like I didn't get a dime out of it until I published the blog post. <laughs> I got a lot of traffic, yeah, but you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, but it definitely did not cover the the damn AWS bill even after the reduction. So, yeah. Uh, (laughs) it's just uh yeah it was an unfortunate learning experience that you know i hope others will learn from um you know if you have publicly available content you can use archive.org to catch it right like if it's already publicly available and you know you want it out there for ever and an eternity that's what archive.org is there for so i put a couple files out there that were too big for the time being, started donating $5 a month for them, you know, basically to just host it. And, you know, I'll take the write off on my taxes, but you know, archive.org gets another donator, right? That's a good deal for them. Um, and then, you know, now I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is the right solution for me long term, right? Like Cloudflare, I don't necessarily trust anymore to do the right thing when it comes to, you know, files, right, of a certain size. So it's like, Okay, and then I have these other files that are like 600, 700 megs. It's like, I need something that can cache a gig. That'd be nice. So it's like all these services will do it. It's just horribly do, complex. Do you really need it cached? Do I, I really need it cached is a question, right? Like, no, I don't necessarily need it cached. But here's the thing. If all of a sudden an old article gets really popular and some old asset gets spun up, right? Like I get hit with a big bill. So that's what I'm trying to prevent, right? Getting hit with the big bill. Well, but I mean, oh, like, so you're publishing assets. And this is really relevant. You'll, you'll uh, talk about what we're, what we're trying to do to control some of this. But you're, mm-hmm. you're talking about publishing an article where there's a, you know, a gig, multi, you know, a larger file. Well, let's say there's like a 30 meg, 30 meg PDF file, right? Like okay. that gets downloaded a thousand times. 15,000 times, 25,000 times. I mean, you're talking web scale sometimes. Yeah. That's going to get expensive if you're serving it straight from S3, right? Like, but, but I, I mean, to me, that's, that's a different use case than something that gets pulled into an automated. Like, I mean, this is where I look at like the Docker container stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like Docker Cloud's got to be going nuts because the number of times when I do a Docker pull, and they download oh, a whole yeah. bunch of stuff to me. Oh. It's like, all right, and there's so many. And and how you know how often do people actually set up like a local repository? Never. And never. And so so I'm spinning up a hundred machines, and all of them go to Docker Hub when they shouldn't. But it doesn't mm-hmm. cost me anything. So who cares? Woo-hoo! Didn't cost you anything. 
Yeah, I, that's something that's really- Doesn't cost you a nickel. Yeah, I mean, somebody, you know, obviously, you know, they're paying a cloud front bill somewhere, right? Yeah. I, it's cash somewhere. You know, it might be Fastly, could be anywhere, but it's cash somewhere, I promise you, all those Docker images, and they're served over a CDN, just like everything else, right? So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a problem, right? Like serving even small files on a global scale is a problem because when it all adds up, it's bandwidth, right? Like it all adds up to somebody has got to pay for this at some point. Yeah. There was enough images in the article itself to actually trigger a billing alert from, or a 50%, you know, thing from Netlify. Like you've hit 50% capacity for your bandwidth. For a static website, that's pretty damn impressive. <laughs> that, was a, that was a nice run, yeah. Do you know how many hits you got on the article? Yeah, I can pull it up real quick. I mean, obviously if you're blocking like Java and crap, uh, you know, I sure. might not catch it, but uh, let's see. Pull up the right website here. Uh, yeah, let's go back. Oh yeah, all time, 70,000 hits. 70,000 views, page views. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. all the images for, uh, you know, evidence was there. Right. You, you, produced, you, know, so you produced a lot yeah. of materials in that, yeah? Right, so nice just even that alone, right? Like on top of the regular web traffic that I normally get from just having a website, you know, around for so long added up to, you know, 50% of my Netlify, you know, capacity this month. It's just a blog post, folks. It's just text and images, <laughs> right? Like, it's just text and images. Yeah. Like, if, you know, like, like, you know, no one pays for my website other than me, right? Like, that comes out of my pocket. And, and that's, it has been the one thing that has advanced my career the most. So that's why I keep doing it. And that's why I keep running it, right? Like, it makes the most sense to me to do that. So for uh, for an event like this to occur, it just like was mind blowing to me that a personal website or a personal anything could do this. Well, it's because I intermix work stuff. <laughs> right. Well, and I mean, you got, you, you hit, and this is, I mean, what's fascinating to me about this, there's, there's all sorts of interesting post-mortem discussions, mm -hmm. right? You hit, you hit Quinny, you, you know, Quinny's, uh, Corey, Quinny Pig, is you know remarkable from that that helped amplify what's going on you hit mm -hmm. a week uh, you hit a holiday weekend mm -hmm. with the you know it's a personal story right we're all we're all we've all been there to one extent or another um that that's a that's a pretty significant spike but you know i look at the amazon bill but we use six or seven different hosting type services and mm -hmm. It's so easy to have something go where you're like, oh crap, somebody left the water on, you know, all week or all month. Well, yeah, like I use, uh, I'll use rigs for streaming, you know, uh, for OpenShift TV uh, in Azure sometimes. And, you know, if I leave one on over the weekend, they are 30 bucks, you know, that you didn't need to spend, you know, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, whoops. So, yeah, right. you know, I just, I, really I need to write some Ansible, you know, I just need to write an Ansible script that just every, like 7 p.m. every day just goes and reaps out all the VMs from that one account, you know. That's what I, you know, it's the thing about stopping, you know, and this is, I, I was, we had a, I don't remember where it was, whether it was here or another meeting I was on. Somebody was like, I thought stopping a VM was stop the billing. And I'm like, oh, no, mm -mm. if it's destroyed, you're good. But if you're not. You got to destroy the snapshots. You got to destroy the disks. You got to make sure it's all gone, right? Like, yeah, I had, um, yeah, I was playing with VPC and I built a, like a load balancer. And I finally went back through the AWS, the AWS bill. And I'm like, all right, what, what the hell is causing, I don't have any, any machines out there. What's causing this region to have, you know, $10 a month, $15 a month in fees. <laughs> right. Like when you're spelunking came for $20, that's, that's like hard. Yeah, it's, that's it's hard, but you, you've you got to, you, you know, it's it's stuff that you have to manage because if you don't, it gets out of control and it's just game over, right? Like it's, yeah. it's you know, there's here's your $2,700 bill, you know, or here's your $2,700 worth of activity within 23 hours, right? <laughs> like maybe you would have gotten an alert on that if you had proper alerting set up, maybe within time, but probably not. No. 
you know, there's a eight to 48 hour lag according to Corey Quinn. So, I mean, just eight hours of that would have been insane. If, if you're driving something really hard. Yeah. This is one of the discussions we have in the team because for us, we're, we're always consuming ISOs. Yeah. Right. Right. So we, yeah. OS, OS ISOs. And we had somebody new show up in the team because if they're forever, not like, uh, you know, Red Hat or Ubuntu, um, you know, release a new version of the whatever and mm. deprecate all the old versions. So, you know, we'll wake up one morning and, oh, CentOS, you know, 8.3 is no longer available and 8.4 is is there and you, you oh, gotta yeah. roll it. Um, and so he was like, well, why don't you just host those ISOs in, you know, S, S3 and let, you know, just there'll be permanent links. And we're like, because, we would become the reliable source for mm. that ISO. <laughs> right. You don't want to. You don't want to be number one for certain things, right? Like, <laughs> like I had a PDF that got directly linked on Reddit oh, one no. time. Yeah, yeah, like that was no good for me, right? Like I'm spending all this money on S3, but I'm not getting anything back out of it. Oh, here's your rewrite. <laughs> here's your redirect to a page, page with an ad on it, and that yeah. PDF is now embedded. You know, <laughs> seriously, like, oh, that's smart. I'm not yeah. going to serve up files for free, folks. I mean, that's, that's not my business. <laughs> I mean, that it's a personal website. You want to deep link something that's on the CDN? Great. But Ugh. don't be surprised if it gets popular, it gets like swapped out for something else. Right? How, you, how, how fast do you find stuff like that? Do you Pretty quick, or, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I check the analytics every day, right? So like, if I see something like out of skew on a day... Like I usually, you know, before I go to bed every night, I'll just run through like this last string of like sysadmin and marketing news apps type thing. And mm. I'll look at, you know, today for certain websites and just see if anything is out of skew or something blew up or, you know, some new sites link into it or whatever. It's just always interesting to see those stats more live than in aggregate because you see those little like links and people noticing you kind of thing from smaller blogs and stuff, which is kind of cool. cool. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's one thing to like have a shocking AWS bill, right? It's another thing to have mental health problems and have a shocking AWS bill, right? Especially when the bill is more than your mortgage and it's, you're on, you're the only person that could do anything about it in the entire household. You can't call for help, right? Like there's, there's no one else in the home that's going to help you with this. You're it. Right. And you've got to solve this problem. And your spouse is looking at you like, I think you can do this, honey, but you got to do it. You know? <laughs> right? Like I, we can't afford this. You know? <laughs> well, if there's, I mean, at some point you're just like, turn all the, turn it all off. Just a big, you know, big stop button. Right. Yeah. I mean, then, I've had the, I did the that diagnostics. a while ago, but then I got bit by it. Right. Like I, I had to do that. I don't know, 2007 when I got divorced I basically like okay. all the websites I had I couldn't afford to run anymore and it was just like oh okay like this is interesting I don't ever want to go back to that again that's why I use stuff like NetLify and Cloudflare and you know okay. cheap S3 buckets and you know <laughs> so it, it you know it if like all of a sudden all my web properties went away like they, that would not, that would be detrimental, right? Like that, that would not be a good look for no, me. Bad, like yeah. I would be essentially undiscoverable, like for my job, for what I do, or, you know, who I am, not having an online presence is not an option. All right. So you also don't want it to be your employer doing it for you. You want to, right. These are, these are your bingo. Episodes. I want to own it myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I want to own it myself. Right. Like I don't mind, like I have no problem doing stuff for work. Right. And it being owned by work, but right. You know, the stuff that I write, the stuff that I do, the things that I produce, I would like to have, you know, control of that. And that I think makes perfect sense, right? That's why I don't recommend people use Medium. You don't have control over who sees your stuff. You don't have control over your own content, how it looks or how it feels or anything like that, you know. Um, and my newsletter started out on Medium. And then eventually I moved it over to Netlify because it just made more sense. And I wanted to use Hugo anyway because I was using it with all my other sites, so yeah, um, static sites are great, but they can be expensive if they get hit a lot. That's the problem, 
it's it's always about scale right <laughs> it's you can build out this tiniest little thing but if it gets hit a ton it's going to cost yeah. you money somehow that makes sense what do you think the balance is between like breaking deep links versus you know driving people back to the the, the core because i mean for to an extent some of this problem to me is a deep linking problem some right because mm -hmm. you would now keep in mind that the link to the to the QCAL file that blew up my S3 bucket bill, like that was yeah. not public. That was Red Hat only, right? Like that was just like <laughs> one coworker okay. or two coworkers had that, right? Like they might have shared it out to a couple of people and then it kind of blew up and I forgot about it, but whatever, right? Like it, that wasn't public. And there's nothing public about that. The fact that it was publicly accessible was the problem. And even if I had restricted it down to just Cloudflare accessible, they were going to Cloudflare. So right. <laughs> it would have got served up that way anyway. Have, have you looked into doing short time or special purpose links? Um, yeah, I mean, I could, I guess. No, I haven't. It's a, it's a worthwhile thought, but to be honest with you, you know, when, the coworker's specific use case was he was doing a Cody demo and like he was practicing the demo. He was going to use, you know, he was going to download this thing maybe once or twice, uh -huh. <laughs> but he needed to do it live during the demo. Right. <laughs> so it needed to sit out there for a couple of weeks. Right. Yeah. So it's not like I could, I, okay, a month. Well, that's still, that's a lot of exposure time for a 13 gig file, yeah. you know, even, even with a month long temporary link. Right. Or even if I set the asset to expire after 45 days, which is actually what I should have done. I should have retired the asset. Yep. How is this? <laughs> yeah. This app. Yeah. I paid $40 for this app. It's totally anytime someone texts me, calls me anything. Uh, yeah. yeah. Zoom no. does Zoom does that to me when I'm using the phone app. It drives me nuts. If, if I get a phone call oh. while I'm on Zoom, uh, Zoom decides to pause my audio, and if I answer it, um, then I will not be able to get my mic back. Because oh. it's it's insane, and I have to leave. I have to. Leave. I can hear, but I have to leave the conference and come back in. So, oh jeez, I, I that's why I use my desktop. I have nice rig on my desktop. So, yeah, but. Um, yeah, there's, um, we did some, we had, I mean, obviously it's funny because your, your, your blog post was really timely for us because we were having this discussion internally about hosting files and basically saying, F no, we're not going to, we're not going <laughs> to, yeah, don't, don't even put them in there. And right, sometimes even, yeah. we have, not even in a private bucket, right? Like if you don't want it on the internet, don't put it on the internet, right? <laughs> like that's the biggest story, right? Like. You, you have to move something across the internet. That's one thing, right? So, so but don't put have, it on the internet and make it public. So, so here's, here's what we did. And if people want, I mean, I can ask our engineer who did it to, uh, yeah, I'm come, curious what you in. did. Um, and it, I mean, it would be a whole, it would be a whole lunch session. Um, yeah. And it was brutal. So it's probably worth doing a lunch and learn to share it. Yeah. What, what we, Amazon has an API out of S3 that mm -hmm. will create single use short term or restricted use URLs for objects. Interesting. Okay. And so um, we, what he, what he was able to do is using that API, you can um, request access to a file and provide somebody with a link that has a time and is, is like has, has restrictions in it. There's a whole bunch mm -hmm. of options on it. Right. And then what, so for that now, cause we have times where like, we have to download a VMware, um, VMDK uh, or whatever. ISO yeah, or, ISOs, and anything, well, we want to, yeah. anything, tons of, tons of like, oh, OVAs, most, of our, yeah. most of our stuff is small. So like, like the plugins and content packs are all small enough to get cached and we don't, we don't stress on it too much. Right. But the ISOs and the OVAs yeah. are, are much different. Those are story. big, they're gigs, they're gigs of data sometimes. Well, and they're also not things that we're allowed to share technically. Even something like, um, for us, the Mega RAID CLI, distributing that is something that we can't, we can't repost their mm, ISOs. Right, yeah. Okay. So you gotta or be their, super their, careful. Their utilities. So, yeah. 
so we don't that can't be in a um, in a you know in a public bucket. And so what we're what we're doing is we've set it up, and this is still really new, so it's just rolling out. But you, if you are an authenticated user, we can give you a special uh, a, a file. So we can there's a couple of ways we can control that, and then that allows you to then download from our S3 bucket using that individual URL. Hmm. Um, and in those cases, like it's like yeah, we're going to pay for the downloads, but it's not you know, an open tap. Right. It's, it's a download or a few downloads, right? To like, a, per, to a person who's been authenticated as a known individual. Right. From that perspective. Yeah. Um, that's what, that was what, so when you were going through that, I'm like, okay, shoot. I'm sure we're still exposed <laughs> on something. Yeah. And you never know. Right. Like, I mean, I scrubbed that bucket and made sure that like, you know, nothing big was in there, you know, nothing that would be you know, uncacheable by Cloudflare was in there. And then I went and put the IP restrictions in for Cloudflare. So you can only hit that bucket through Cloudflare. So it should be cached, think about. Yeah. you know, but like, who knows? <laughs> who knows? All of a sudden Cloudflare can be like, wow, you've blown through, you know, two terabytes of cached data. We're not going to support you anymore. Bye. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're I just, off the platform. Well, yeah, because this is this is like where Cloudflare is. I found it to be super opaque from that perspective. Like, yeah, even, they were just even, like, we can't help you. Sorry. But even knowing what's, I mean, there are some statistics. Like, you can see what's getting hit, but you know, it's sort of like until something breaks, you don't know what it's actually getting passed through. Right. You don't know okay. what's yeah. getting requested. You don't know what's actually being served. You have no log logs unless you're like an actual like enterprise customer or whatever business customer um and even then it's like seven days so i would not have seen i would not have been able to go back in time and see these logs <laughs> you know i would cloudflare would have done nothing for me at that point like i think i would have had to put in like a special request but here's the thing you know they have the data because cops aren't putting in subpoena within 14 days, right, of some crime happening, right? Like, you know they have those logs for criminal purposes, right? Like, if for legal reasons, they have logs of what data went through their platform. You know, know they that, do somewhere. I know that in CloudFront, using Amazon's um, uh, CDN, uh, we get Apache type logging of every request also to an S3 bucket, which then I can really, I can query through Athena, which lets me query mm -hmm. all those logs using SQL. Hmm. Yeah, but it's like, I don't even, like, that's, that's overkill for me, right? Like, I don't want to query my logs with SQL. I want, like, Webalizer <laughs> or someone, one of those old school tools to just, like, but look it, at it the bucket. But it gives me Apache like, format logging. Yeah, that's it, right? I can, like, download, me, I can download the files from S3. Yeah, and I can just grab that and go, right? Like, that might be my solution, right? Like, I just start buying CloudFront, you know, how, and just deal with that bill. So. How hard was that to set up? Like, uh, hard was setting it up for mortals? Oh yeah. Uh, to set up a to set up CloudFront logging is a V. It's yeah, it's like it's a click. It's a checkbox. You point yeah, it to an okay. S three bucket where to write to. Tell mm -hmm. it whether you wanted to write the logs every minute or every sixty minutes, something like that. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think we I think we have something. I like enable that logging. Set up. Yeah, so, on the bucket yeah, I don't too. Think I we monitor. Shane Shane would know better than I would. Yeah, but here's the thing: you got to store you got to store the logs. You got to cycle the logs. Yeah, you got to yeah, you got to manage the logs, right? Think of how much you pay to pull the logs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's the thing is you, the their logging goes to an S3 bucket only. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, and yes, we have it turned on, Rob, on some of our buckets. I figure, I, I know we have it on some on some things. I don't think we do a lot of analysis. Not on all, everything. Yeah. Yeah. It just came to a point for us that, that we write hundreds of gigs of, of CloudFront logs that the only way to find something is with, is with SQL. Dang. Well, yeah, at that point, I would want Athena. But like some of these logs, like I don't know how often I'm dropping these things. Oh, these are every few minutes. I mean, some of these logs like are empty, right? Like some of these files are just zero right. byte files, right? Like, or near zero. Um, so like, I don't need that kind of like <laughs> analysis, right? Like some of these files are like at most 3K, 4K. You know, I don't need that kind of, I don't know. This is, this is to me where it starts getting interesting. Shane, go ahead. 
I was just going to say that AWS S3 logging also explicitly states that they do not guarantee log delivery. So you don't know if they've dropped logs or not whenever they felt like it. Ah, that's awesome. That's great. That's good to know. What's that called? At least at most once delivery? At least at, <laughs> at most least once delivery. Was... At nice. most one delivery. Uh, Jeez. I, this is what, what's stunning to me as excited we, as we are about all this technology. It still feels like, you know, the leading provider is just dumped a couple of services together and it's like. Yeah. 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 No, but here's the thing. Like people are scanning my S3 bucket and now I'm storing logs of like 404s. <laughs> oh, because you were so public about it. So now I, people are scanning. Now it. people are like scanning it like it's something. 404s or 503s? 404s. Oh, 403s or whatever. 403s, the not authorized. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. 404, like, no search lifecycle configuration. But yeah, like. That's the type, um, that's, that I get hit with every new sysadmin I get is like, why am I getting 403 on, on, on S3 buckets all the time? Well, you're not authorized. It's like the files, that must mean the files there, but I don't have access to it. No, no, just MS3 just returns 403s. Which they should so, do. So you guys are yeah, just and this is just some Java client scanning my S3 bucket. You guys are just reinforcing my opinion of Amazon being just a, a giant kludge. And whenever something seems useful, they push it out. Yep, they do. Like, look at Elasticash. That's my number one most hated service ever, right? Whenever you have a problem with Elasticash, it takes hours to fix. It's because it's duct tape and bubble gum. Yep. And, and that's a product. It's Not enough. only that, we get, we get clued in on um, uh, early roadmap items. And some of them just are products that just make no sense. And, you know, <laughs> they start telling us about how they're going to build something. And they really don't know what they're going to build yet. No, they don't. They have an idea that a customer is doing this thing that kind of looks like this. Maybe, hey, here you go. Try that out, customer. Oh, it's probably just AT&T saying, we really need this. You're probably right. It's probably one customer saying, we want this, and they productize it. Yeah. I think they came to us in order to know what to build. They're like, what would you like to see in this type of product? Oh, sandbox. that's when you know well so that's interesting right when we're i was not a small aws customer i should point out yeah yeah yeah. like <laughs> that was when i was at a place i was consulting a certain cloud provider came in and said so if you wanted a service from us what would you need and like these are like bleeding edge cloud folks and they're like what do you mean a mainframe <laughs> like, how do you talk to that <laughs> Can we, can we, are there APIs for that? <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, all right. These are the people building clouds, got it. Yeah, that's, that's is... my view of, of the, the world of clouds out there, unfortunately. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I mean, when you think about what, they're, what they've got and what they're doing, part of their competitive advantage is that's the playground. And if you're watching what, what people are doing and what works, you get enough of a sample size and you, you're, you know, you're, and, and you're, you're good at listening. Mm -hmm. This was a uh, short, short story on, on that. Like uh, 10 years ago when I was at Dell, we were working with Joyent. Back in the days when they were doing Solaris zones, which sound a lot like oh, containers. Oh, what are those? Those sound yeah, like containers. Yeah, who knows that? Those things are stupid. Nobody wants those were the good old days. We were running zones in production. We were just spinning <laughs> up. We were cloning zones and spinning them up. We we had um uh, oh okay, I'm getting yeah. nostalgic Anyways. here. Yeah, no, no, yeah. good containers done well. But the the Dell the Dell people were like, what? Why are they figuring that? I'm like. They have the cool people, right? They had Twitter at the time. They have the cool people playing around in their in their utility. They know what people are asking for. Yeah. And that they're gonna move faster just because they have people asking the smart questions. Right. And, and that's that's well, a yeah. big and deal. that's where Netflix really uh, gave them a big advantage having Netflix out there because Netflix has really solid engineering. Mm -hmm. Imagine what AWS would look like if Netflix hadn't told them to do a few things. <laughs> yeah, or if Netflix didn't open source a few services. 
Yeah. 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 No, these are these are interesting stories. Um, I'm going to wrap us up with a seg with an Amazon crazy service segue. Nice. A couple of weeks ago, they introduced something called Honey Code. I saw that. Which is, it's, it's read like Access. If you remember Access and Visual Basic, it was mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. their their own version of that. Which, but I'm I'm like, dude, this is completely unacceptable. The name is way too close to Honeycomb. And um, and so I was ranting off about them, not for the product being good. It's like this crazy experimental form builder, mm. but picking you know their their lawyers should should know better than to pick a product name that's that close to another business. And so I was very indignant on Honeycomb's behalf. And my segue is two weeks we have. Charity Majors, who's going to come in and talk about observability. Uh, Rocky, I was able to make that connection. Thank you Yay! for the suggestion. Good job. And so we go from Amazon to Honey to Charity in like two steps. We're perfect. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you. Um, we are I'm moving the notices for this, um, these sessions over to the Cloud 2030 topic. And so um, we'll have a place where we can post those and chat and, and do other things like that. So check that out. Um, I'm super excited about, about that as a forming network. And then we're doing Thursdays. We're going to talk about cloud strategy um, stuff on Thursday evenings. Um, so mm. 3, 3 p.m. Pacific, 5. We're starting with a two-hour session with the Cloud 2020 retrospective. How do we get on the invite list? If you go to cloud2030.mn.co. MN as in Minnesota? Yeah, Mighty Networks. Ah. Um, then, so the, that's a weekly series we're spinning up. Um, and it's just a whole community. So my goal here is that we're going to start discussions. There will be a summit in November after Election Day where we actually sort of like try and codify a cloud 2030 manifesto or mission statement. Um, but then we're collecting people to keep talking about infrastructure. Uh, there's some start there. I wrote a mission statement for it and we'll keep refining it as, as people come into the community, but it's, uh, you'll appreciate it's, I, I said, we're neither the uh, rebel Alliance trying to death star the major providers nor the, um, uh, uh, that when well, now I'm blanking on my it's so <laughs> so beautiful um, um, or um, why am I blanking on Star the Wars? Star Wars the Star Wars um, the bad the, uh, the bad <laughs> no no the bad the bad the um, one with Natalie Portman no yeah I know you like that one the Born best troopers. but um, Baseball? Trying to Alderaan, anyway, they're trying to Alderaan all the on-premises sites. Um, oh, the Death Star? <laughs> the Death Star. No, who's, who owns the Death Star? It's the... It's... Oh, I have no idea. No, and the, I just watched the, the bad, one, the Admiral. Death Star. Admiral, the, yeah, whatever. Yeah, no, the, um, the, the, Darth the, Vader? Like the, the dark side? No, no. no it's, it's, uh, I got to draw up everybody. I'll catch y'all. Right, the Chris, other side of the alliance. Thank you for having me on. It's not the Enterprise. It's the... My God, it just completely evacuated from my Empire. Brain. Empire. And I knew NE something. It's not the enter Empire trying to alter on all of the on-premises legacy providers either. It's we're trying to live the live the dream and figure out the future. So, all right, everybody. Wow, that was sad. I just completely lost it. I have to tattoo that on my, my hand or something. Everybody have a good week. Bye. You too. You too. Bye bye. Afternoon, Rob. Good to see you. Good to see you, sir. How's everything? Good. Very good. Been running around trying to start uh, cloud stuff, so the cloud 2030s pieces. So nice. That has been. Chris, I'm about to move you to full panelist. Hold on. I click the wrong button. Yeah, I'm super excited about the Cloud 2030 stuff and the, the platform.
for it. So, I cool. Think there's some. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm a little nonplussed with the client, but I think I just need to learn it better. That's what I've been getting that feedback. People are like, uh, this, I don't, is it Twitter? Is it Slack? Is it, you know, um, and so. Well, we're, we're no, my biggest complaint is that I have to go root around on my email and find the invitation to go find the, the room again. When I navigate away from the client, it doesn't huh. assume I'd like to go back to the, the uh, conversations I've already joined, which is what oh, was That's great. interesting. Okay. Have you tried it on your phone? I'm using it on my iPad. Yeah, okay, so it's the same. I haven't done as much on my phone. I've been sort of responding to uh, to chats as, as we go. And uh, we'll see. I, I, I'm very optimistic about it, but I haven't been using it for, you know, for other things. So this is sort of a dive in and then hope it, hope everything, everything works strategy. Cool. Hey, Chris. How you doing? Good. How are you? Oh, I can't complain. If I did, no one would listen. <laughs> Very professional looking setup. <laughs> it's a very Thank professional you. looking setup, Chris. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Um, I'm trying to work my camera game out a little bit better, and I'm not sure I'm doing myself much good. We'll see. Yeah, but Chris, you can you can deter you can move that camera away from the Florida Gator symbol or flag. As you can <laughs> as well. We in Georgia don't like we don't you know. Hey, Gator oh. meat goes really well here, brother. You can just have that up the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I like some Gator meat. <laughs> It tastes all right, I guess. I mean, whatever. First, first rule of pet peeves is never reveal your pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> or team affiliations, maybe. Eh, you know, I'm used to hearing all kinds of craziness. Like, growing up, like, in Florida during the 90s, right? The Spurrier and everything. And mm. Bobby Bowden going back and forth, like, I've gotten to so many like almost fist fights over, you know, football talk before. It's water off the back nowadays. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, only in SEC country can you do that. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Fighting words. That's awesome. Hey, it's the only it's the only conference that has a game that Officially, is no longer named the largest cocktail, uh, cocktail party. party. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty wild. It's officially right. not named that. It, they <laughs> changed the name. It was officially named or branded as the largest ah. cocktail party in the world, the Georgia Florida game. But they uh, perceived the perceived, you know, <laughs> uh, problem of that is. Uh, has been changed, but supposedly uh, that was supposed to cut back on the drinking. I don't, no, I don't think that helped at all. No. Whatever. Yeah. I, I gotta exactly. say, the most sophisticated level of drinking I, I've seen in my years is the UVA folks. Oh, really? Um, yeah, because they they put their alcohol in um, their vodka in um, Ziploc bags and put it in their jackets. So they dress with blazers to games. And their alcohol is in the Ziploc bag, you know, by Coke. You okay. Yeah. I thought that was a very level of sophistication. <laughs> See, I went to a UNC <laughs> game once and uh, I walked into the men's room and it, the, the trash can was just overflowing with many bottles. So I thought that was just like <laughs> an ultimate, like, you should just go ahead and monetize this, folks. You know, yes. <laughs> like, people bottles? are going to do this anyway. Yeah, many yeah. bottles. They were just bringing, because they don't check your pockets or anything, right? Like, it's all plastic. Metal detector won't ever go off, right? Like, you know. That's true. So, you know, the cheap plastic bottles, you can buy like the 12-pack of, people would just throw a couple in each pocket. I, yeah, but that that complete, completely blows my mind on college drinking. It's like, you know, it's supposed to be Mad Dog 2020 and, and 
you know the cheapest vodka you can get oh, so. no. like i was sitting in the the, the season ticket section oh uh, okay gotcha yeah no, that's where the good stuff is no oh, man <laughs> This is the alumni. The alumni section is all is all mini. Is there is all airport bottles? Yeah, what? <laughs> I'm hearing. <laughs> you know, you're an SEC country at LSU. This is I. I, I spent five years in, in in Baton Rouge at LSU. You can't buy your way into season tickets. So if you come in there in town and you're a big wig and you're trying to move a business there and you say to the Chamber of Commerce, "Hey, can we get some season tickets for our executive team?" They're like, no. It's the only place I've ever seen where you can't buy your way into something. That's how involved alumni are in the SEC. I think Penn State is probably the largest non-SEC school, or Michigan, that I've seen that's like that. Um, I mean, Ohio Penn State's State, kind of like that, yeah. Oh, yeah, Because yeah. Penn State, I mean, what, what, what Penn State got, when Penn State got the fine, because of Paterno and the, the whole oh, thing. Yeah. The, yeah. the alumni said, we got it. I mean, that's just, it was a $50 million fine in the alumni, and the booster said, we got it. Oh. Dang. <laughs> Dang. Talk about not making an impact. No. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. See, Texas, okay. isn't, Texas is not that different from that perspective. Oh, you guys are weird. You're the only state <laughs> that I know that people, people get in trouble for offering jobs to high school students parents like so mm -hmm. you know you recruit a kid in a different district and you offer the parents a job in the local district to get the kid to come play at your high school that's a whole nother level that's the next level high school yeah. like yeah like it was i mean it was crazy playing football in florida my freshman year but like texas is a whole nother level yeah so i, I was in the band they tried to recruit me into football and i politely declined because I really didn't want to get hit and they're like no 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 it's not a you can do both you just you just run down onto the field at halftime playing the band and you know <laughs> and then just go switch back in your uniform it's not a big deal <laughs> nice. yeah nice. They, did, they didn't promise you that don't get hit the, the, the don't get uh, hit. exactly no, no. That's, what, that's what immediately yeah. what I, I was thinking I'm like what about getting hit when you're playing in the band mm -hmm. the <laughs> well yeah as long as it well yeah so I'll, I'll i'll leave that be but yeah as, as long as as long as you're not in the rice band and and you know making fun of the texas and AM guys i think you're okay yeah you're probably fine <laughs> i imagine anybody making fun of any texas a&m folk <laughs> are probably gonna get a hard time getting out of that stadium yeah yeah is this uh is this quorum today rob have we uh I know we just started these back up, so I'm not sure how much attendance we'll have. Yeah, uh, so we usually we get up to about 12. Depends on the. Depends. On, I thought I actually expected Chris to bring in a whole bunch of people. So. Yeah. Well, apparently, I didn't What's do up, a good Chris? job marketing this for you. Where's, where's your followers, man? I don't know, man. They read the blog post. <laughs> <laughs> the blog post was excellent. <laughs> blog post was really excellent. And Quinny Quinny Pig didn't didn't amplify it either. So or a no, he did. He All did. Right. All right. Oh oh no, he did not amplify this. Okay. No 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 no. He amplified the the blog post though. In your story, yep. Yeah. I some of it I think is is dog See? days of Look, summer. Well, he'd follow me over. Yeah. Yeah. See. Is that your coffee? We talked about it this morning. Yeah, that's my coffee. We okay. talked about it this morning on my live stream. So can't beat that, man. That's doing awesome. my best. Well, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. And this is right. I, I there's a degree of it's summer. I I don't know if that matters. Anymore. I know there's a lot of people on PTO right now. We're just, I mean, there's actually an email thread right now going on uh, in in my internal circle. Should we cancel our weekly meeting tomorrow? <laughs> That's the, uh, I, there's a, I keep talking about it for us. It's like, you know, should we just force people to take, you know, take a couple of days in the middle of, of this stuff just because other, you know, we're not going anywhere. So people don't want to stop working. Right? Friday. I just actually uh, just read a HBR post. Uh, they said like, even if you're not going anywhere, still take your vacation days. Right. Like it's, it's imperative that you take them. But Friday is Red Hat shutting down day, Red Hat recharge day. So we've done oh, that nice. the past three months, I think. I don't know when the next one is planned or if another one is planned, but they definitely did it for the summer quarters for sure. 
Nice. So, yeah. So, yeah, yeah Klaus. Go ahead. Hey, Klaus says he reads the newsletter and is like, yeah, the newsletter just started back up. <laughs> so, thank you for reading. <laughs> what a nice service. I just your news like you're you are how much time do you spend reading news to, so like, i mean it used to be hours and hours and hours a week but now it's okay. literally just you know in my downtime i'll just go through my filtered news and it's racked and stacked in a way that you know thanks to my news reader it's able to provide me uh the news that would get into the newsletter in general okay. uh, i've got it tuned in and dialed in enough to where it's just like well, that's been 30 45 minutes a day tops. I'm good, but I read more news than that every day. I guarantee it. Makes so. sense. Yeah, I like I like seeing the curated. You're doing yeah, I mean it's stuff. it's hard to find quality content. There's plenty of content. It's hard to find quality <laughs> content. Yeah. What do you? Is there is there something specific that you that you key off on? I'm always curious. Uh, so I use an RSS reader. Um, it's called I Know Reader. So it actually adds in. A, I actually pay for it. So the professional edition or whatever. So I can get over 500 feeds, which that by itself tells you how much news I'm actually like filtering through. Um, so that's one way to filter it. You know, it's just the RSS feed you read from. But then they have a way to you know remove all duplicate entries. So like if somebody posts a press release to 700 blogs. It's just one post, um, you know, and they also have a way to tell you how popular or how much traffic a particular post is getting across their own platform. So, or across uh, analytics in general that they're being able to cobble together. So it's a very, very easy and nice way for me to be like, I can read the news now sanely and in a filtered way and removing all the duplication and scrolling and unnecessary just clicking. Hmm. So yeah, it's it's really nice. I've got the same setup on my phone, iPad, and computer. It's all just uh, right on one little uh, app called Ino Reader. I will post a link to it right now if you don't mind. Thank you. I'm sure they have an affiliate program that I'm losing out on <laughs> tens of cents from, but whatever. <laughs> and it's in the newsletter. There you go. Mm. That's right. I did mention it in the newsletter this week because it is a very good service and people should subscribe to it, to be honest with you. So, yeah, um, 